Hello and welcome to SIPS Level 2 Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations Revision Tips. This is for Module 5 Inventory, Logistics and Expediting. Learning Outcome 2 which is to understand the principles and processes associated with effective logistics control. So first you're going to look at something called life cycle costs. And life cycle cost analysis will assess all the costs involved in inventory management. These things consider not only the purchase price of the item you're, you're storing, but the cost of inward delivery, the staff involved with the receipt and handling, as well as the equipment, the storage, packaging and preparation, the cost to dispatch it towards your customer, insurance, as well as overheads. The factors that impact on whole life costs will also include energy saving measures. For example, deciding to purchase high performing insulating glazing, which saves you on utility costs over time. The life of the equipment, calculating how long a piece of machinery will last, such as a forklift truck, and how much maintenance it will require, can help a buyer to work out whether the items with lower purchase price are actually offering value for money. The labour costs, double handling of the time taken to clean complex tools can impact on labour costs. Technology, the use of new or existing software and hardware can increase efficiency. And then fluctuating material prices, so buying in bulk from new suppliers can affect the price. Now the main risks to items in storage and during transit include um, age and deterioration, erosion and corrosion, impact, leakage, seepage and wastage, and pilferage. So let's go through them in a bit of detail. So from an age point of view, all items will deteriorate over time, especially items that are perishable like food. Erosion or corrosion, is where rust is caused by oxygen in the air which is combined with moisture and over time this affects untreated minerals and metals. In terms of impact any movement of materials will be a risk of damage. Leakage and seepage and wastage come from things like liquids, powders and other granular materials that can escape from their packaging. And pilferage, a fancy word for stealing and theft. So high value items are vulnerable to being stolen. Any material could be taken without the owner's permission. The flow of inventory can be made more effective and can contribute to reduce life cycle costs by minimizing the risks, standardizing your international logistics, particularly for shipping and air freight containers and improving the efficiency of handling. Your inventory handling management system should include multidisciplinary planning, just-in-time shipments, something called first in first out, which is a stock rotation method, which is more relevant for short life products, but you might use a first in last out approach for others. Installing space saving equipment, such as high bay racking and roller stacking and designing ergonomic storage and handling areas to make picking and packing easier, as well as providing training for your operatives. But what factors should we be considering when deciding on the method of transport to use? Let's look at the modes of transport first. So in terms of the road transport, this is most commonly used and the most versatile method of goods transport and often the least expensive option. But delays can be caused by poor road conditions, bad weather and heavy traffic, and there is also a risk of accident. With the railway, this has got some benefits of the speed of transport over long distances, and it's the most environmentally friendly way and can be used for large and heavy items. The reduced risk of collision makes it, makes it suitable for hazardous items. But there is no flexibility on routes and it's not a door-to-door -door service so other methods of transport still need to be used. Air freight. 
This is a good method for items with short lead times or perishable due to the speed of delivery over a long distance. But it can be costly and may not be appropriate to some types of shipments, such as <clears throat> foodstuffs and agricultural products, which are prohibit prohibited from crossing international boundaries. And then we've got sea freight, which is reliable and very cost effective, especially when you're transporting large and bulky goods across long distances. It has the largest carrying capacity and a relatively low incident in terms of breakdowns and accidents. But the downside is, of course, it can take a long time for the shipments to arrive. And you need to be there in time to meet the ocean carrier's departure times, and it's not a door-to-door -door solution. There is one more method I want to tell you about, which is called pipelines. This is a common method for transporting natural gas, liquids, and slurries of coal. Routes can be laid on land or underwater and can reach remote areas. Your transportation costs are very low once they've been set up and it makes a good option for long-term contracts. But the downside is only government bodies and large multinational energy companies can afford to construct and maintain long-range pipelines. There is no flexibility once a route has been set up and they re require careful maintenance to, to reduce the chance of accidents caused by leaks or terrorist activity. So coming back to these methods that we would consider. So think about your air freight, your road freight, your rail freight, your sea freight, and ask yourself, which one is better for speed? Which one is the most cost effective? Which one's the most dependable? What one will maintain the quality of your product? And the final one, packaging. This is regarding the preparation and packaging that's required to avoid damage or theft. We're now going to look at INCO terms. INCO terms stands for International Commercial Terms. They're devised by the International Chamber of Commerce and indicate how costs and responsibilities are assigned between the buyer and the seller. It's concerned only with who has responsibilities for the goods, licenses, clearances at the different stages of delivery. It doesn't really cover the question of when ownership is transferred from the supplier to the buyer. So this needs to be negotiated separately. The more the buyer pays for, the more control. The more the supplier pays for, the more they control. When the supplier is in control, the buyer doesn't need to arrange much, if anything. However, it can sometimes mean the cheapest transport is selected, which may be less reliable and predictable. There are four main groups. The terms that start with the letter E, F, C and D. I'm going to start with the E terms first. E means departure. And the only one I'm aware of is EXW, which stands for X Works. In terms of the supplier, there's minimum obligations. They're only responsible for ensuring goods are available at their premises. The buyer takes responsibility for all the transportation and all the risks relating to that transportation, such as the safety and ownership of the item. So as you can see from the diagram on the slide, the seller only pays for anything in their building, the buyer pays for everything else. Let's move on to the F terms then. This means main carrier is unpaid. So the main ones we've got are um, <clears throat> FCA, which stands for free carrier, FAS, free alongside, and FOB is free on board. The supplier must pay and transfer the goods to a carrier free of risk and without charging the buyer. In a sense, they get it to this port of departure. As you can see, the seller cost arrow gets all the way to the port of departure. And then the buyer pays for the subsequent cost of the carriage thereafter. So if you take um, FOB, for example, free on board, the seller will ensure that the um, container is actually on the board of the ship. FAS will just get it on the key alongside the ship.
We're now going to look at the C terms. C means main carriage is paid. Essentially, the seller is paying for it to the port of arrival in most cases. This is an odd one. So the common ones we've got are CIF, which stands for cost of cost or cost or carriage insurance and freight. CIP, carriage insurance paid, and CPT, carriage paid to. So essentially the supplier arranges all the freight needs for the shipment from source to destination, including arranging all licenses and clearances, loading and paying for the truck to get to the port, loading at the port, the ocean shipment and the insurance during the crossing, except for the ones where it's just um, C and F. Uh, CFR which is carriage and freight there's no insurance if you're selecting those terms the buyer is responsible just for the insurance but other than that the buyer is responsible for getting delivery from the agreed port of arrival to the final destination and the final terms begin with the letter D D means arrival so examples are DDP which is door-to-door -door delivery or delivered duty paid DAP delivered at a place or DAT is delivered at a terminal and the supplier pays for all the costs and has responsibilities for getting the goods to an agreed destination. They only fulfill their obligations once the goods have arrived. Now <clears throat> that's the very final term and it's the complete opposite of the E terms where the buyer does everything. And there's a nice summary there, which you can look at on the internet. These are Inco Terms 2010. They're refreshed every 10 years. But this is a really nice table that shows the different terms on the left and then the obligations across the top and who pays for what. That one there, um, CIF, is the one where the seller will pay the insurance um, or there's the buyer will pay it if it's paid to a destination. So that, that, that's the only odd one with the insurance. And then finally, the documents used in the transportation of supplies, there are lots of regulations relating to international sourcing that must be complied with. So we've got domestic import regulations, cross-border issues between um, countries that have got trading blocks, taxes such as imports and export duties, value added tax, VAT or sales tax. And there are restrictions and prohibited items like firearms, explosives, ammunition, foodstuffs and agricultural project products that are restricted. So the buyer needs to look at global sources to fully understand their own country's domestic import regulations. The method you can use is to search the government information on the internet, asking other procurement professionals who also import products from another country or you can inquire at the port or airport at which you would potentially be bringing products or materials into. A buying organisation can engage an import broker to advise them or get the product or material delivered in an expedited fashion. So for example, by handling the paperwork at the point of import. But these are the documents we'll use. The first one is known as a SAD, Single Administrative Document which is a standardised customs form used to control goods being moved in and out of the EU, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Turkey, Macedonia and Serbia. Quite often it will be accompanied by a packaging list, sorry, a packing list, which is an itemised list of the package's contents, which is prepared by the supplier. A bill of lading or an airway bill Carrier's contract and receipt for goods, it agrees to transport from one place to another and to deliver to the designated recipient, the consignee. A consignment note describes the contents of a shipment prepared by the seller and countersigned by the carrier as a proof that the carrier has received the goods for delivery. A bill of lading is something that the ship owner would provide to the seller when the goods had been put on board their, their ocean freight. Sometimes you need a certificate of origin, which is a document that customs officials require because it identifies the country of origin of the imported goods and it certifies the supplier's country 
designated authority to authenticate the source of the goods. And finally, a letter of credit, which is a guarantee of payment that's issued by the buyer's bank. It states that as long as the goods and services received are in line with the terms of the sale, the buyer's bank will send payment to the supplier's bank. Thank you for watching.